Chapter Five: First Solo Mission. Good day, everyone. Rune here, and this is Chapter Five of my "What If Light Became a Nobody" story. If you're new to this story, click the link in the description below to be taken to the playlist. Now let's begin the next chapter. I don't think this is working. Tilk sighs in disappointment as he looks at his summoning window. After seeing the images of Roxas and Shion on the window, he'd gone to the two of them as soon as the time that the sun would come up arrived. The older teens had been just as surprised and asked if this meant that Tilks could summon them now. The idea was certainly appealing, as it would be really helpful during team-ups, but Tilks had to admit that he didn't know. After all, the images of Roxas and Shion weren't in the lineup with the other summons. The trio had decided to head over to Twilight Town to test their theory. However, after three hours of trying with Roxas and Shion trying different distances, with Shion even heading back to HQ to see if that would work, they still had no success. Every other time that Tilks used a summon, it's felt natural, like a half-forgotten instinct. But when he tries to summon Roxas and Shion, he doesn't feel that natural tug at the back of his mind that lets him tap into his magic. He just feels... silly. Roxas pats Tilks on the shoulder with a comforting smile, telling him not to worry. Sure, their images don't mean that Tilks can summon them, but he's sure Tilks will figure out what it does mean sooner or later. Tilks returns the smile with a small one of his own before they head back to HQ. When they arrive, they're startled to find Sykes waiting for them in the mission room, ready with a stern look as Tilks represses the urge to hide behind Roxas. Well, add that to the list of things nobody should not experience. What is he, five? Oh, wait. Technically speaking, he would only be a few months old, wouldn't he? So, would that make him hiding behind Roxas normal? Bah! Who cares? Nothing about this situation is normal. He snapped out of his thoughts as Sykes focuses his attention on him. In an ice-cold voice, he tells Tilks that all of the other members already have important missions to attend to, so there's no one to act as Tilks' chaperone. A sarcastic question about this meaning that he gets the day off sits at the tip of Tilks' tongue, but he refrains. Sykes is unnerving enough without pissing him off. Unaware of the snide remark Tilks is holding back, Sykes continues explaining that this means that Tilks will be going on his first solo mission today. It'll be to a world that has already been visited by several members of the organization before, including him. They're not about to let him go to a world they have little to no knowledge of for the first time. His mission will be to Agrabah, and he is to gather information on recent goings on there. In particular, they want information on places of importance to that world. Swallowing around the lump in his throat, Tilks gives a silent nod. Seeing the action, Sykes walks away, causing the two boys to let out breaths that they hadn't realized they'd been holding. With the oppressive atmosphere gone, Roxas wishes Tilks luck on his first solo mission before going to stock up on supplies for his own mission. Taking a deep breath to steal himself, Tilks walks through the portal to whatever awaits him in Agrabah. After a moment in the black darkness of the portal, bright light stings his eyes, causing him to flinch and close them. After a few seconds, he hesitantly opens them again. When he does, they instantly widen in surprise as he sees the familiar landscape of sand, stone buildings, and wooden stalls stretching out from the roof that he had arrived atop of. Only, it's very different from when he first arrived here. Where before, the streets were deserted, now they're bustling with people and chatter. Everywhere, there are people calling out their wares, haggling over prices, or performing for the crowd. Seeing all of the people and the way that they're dressed, Tilks can't help but feel that he'll stand out like a sore thumb. Feeling strangely self-conscious, he pulls his hood up to hide his face. It wouldn't make any logical difference since nobodies are easily forgotten by those they meet, but it still makes him feel a little better. With his hood up, he makes his way down to the ground, unable to hear anything except a loud jumbled cacophony from the roof. Once he's on the ground, he slowly makes his way into the crowd. Once he's surrounded by the chatter of the market, it's almost enough to overwhelm him, making him feel jittery and claustrophobic. Quickly, he moves to a spot near a stall where the crowd thins out and the noise is less oppressive. He sits there for a moment, listening to the voices around him, trying to pick up any useful information. After a few minutes, he starts to notice the vendor of the stall he's next to giving him some side-eye. 
Which prompts him to realize that it's probably not a good look for him to be sitting there for no apparent reason in strange clothes in a market having not bought anything. He gets up and is about to move elsewhere when something that feels like a nut smacks into the side of his head. Turning around to see where it came from, he doesn't see anyone. But then the nut thrower is completely forgotten as he sees a tall, burly man looming over a pair of kids, a long, curved sword in his hand. Eyes widening in shock and fear, he runs forward. As he gets closer, he begins to hear the man shouting, accusing the children of stealing from his stall. The merchant reaches out for one of the children, just as Tilks jumps in between them and the man. The merchant glares at him, telling him to get out of the way, but Tilks firmly refuses. The merchant glares at him, telling the hooded boy that he will deal with thieves how he wants. Tilks glares back and, despite his face being hidden by the hood, the man still takes a step back, somehow able to feel the weight of his glare. Tilks demands to see what proof the man has that the children stole from his stall. The merchant snarls, shouting that the children were loitering around his stall even though they have no money and how his prized ruby necklace is gone. He gestures to the velvet pillow with nothing on it to emphasize his point. What more proof could the stranger want? Tilks huffs and tells the merchant, as though he were talking to a child, that that evidence is circumstantial at best. Dozens of people have been around his store without buying anything in the last few minutes alone, let alone since the market opened. The merchant retorts that he'd been keeping a close eye on the necklace all day. It only disappeared the moment he turned away to help a customer and those two street brats were the only ones close enough to steal it. Tilks counters this with the logical hole that if they had stolen it, then wouldn't they have gotten the heck out of Dodge while his back was still turned? Completely fed up with this circular argument, Tilks demands to examine the crime scene and gather evidence and clues, as clearly the merchant isn't interested in finding the real culprit or getting his overpriced necklace back and only wants to punish innocent kids for a crime they didn't commit. At this point, the loud argument has guarded the attention of most of the market. Whispers of the merchant's poor character are beginning to escalate into angry murmurs, making the merchant realize how this is beginning to look to potential customers. With gritted teeth, he tells the hooded stranger to search all he wants. He won't find anything but proof that the street brats did it. Tilks bites back a scathing remark at that. Now is not the time to continue giving this creep a piece of his mind. Now is the time for clearing the names of two innocent children. He examines the pillow. It's quite nicely made. However, there are some puncture marks and pulled threads in the fabric near the top. They're too big to be needle marks though, and human nails wouldn't leave these kinds of marks. He sees something black poking out from between two pieces of jewelry and reaches out for it, ignoring the merchants shouting behind him. Taking hold of the mysterious thing, he pulls it out from where it had fallen and finds it to be a jet black feather. Puncher marks, a black feather, missing jewelry. Tilks turns away from the stall and begins to scan the buildings surrounding it. Aha! There! He can see some twigs poking out from the edge of a nearby window cover. He turns to the merchant, asking if he has a ladder. The man blinks with surprise before huffing and glaring at him. He tells Tilks that even if he did have one, he wouldn't be letting the boy use it to escape this situation. Tilks rolls his eyes in irritation. Why are some people so stupid and stubborn? Placing the feather on the pillow, he walks up to the building that he'd identified and begins to scale the wall, earning gasps of surprise from the crowd. The merchant shouts for him to come back and not to run from the mess he made, are drowned out by the shouts of him to come back down before he hurts himself from the crowd. He ignores them. After a few minutes, he manages to reach the wooden window cover he'd identified. And, sure enough, there it is. A bird's nest, and right in the middle of it, surrounded by other small shiny things, is a ruby necklace. Quickly, he grabs the necklace before jumping from his perch back to the ground. The force of his landing causes some of the sand to fly up, almost getting into his eyes. Okay, maybe that wasn't the smartest idea, but he's still not done. Holding up the necklace, he asks the merchant if this is the necklace that went missing. 
The man doesn't respond, but the look on his face is answer enough. With an irritated huff, Tilks places the necklace back on its pillow while explaining to the merchant that some birds, like crows, are attracted to shiny things. He advises that the merchant start covering his wares with some kind of glass or mesh covering to prevent things like this in the future while approaching him. Then, he stares the man in the face, his own face hidden, but his eyes almost seeming to glow red in his anger. In a low, cold voice, he advises the man to never accuse and threaten children again. With that done, he walks past the man and up to the children. As though the last minutes never happened, he asks them if they're okay. The children nod, eyes wide with wonder and admiration. The look makes Tilks want to squirm uncomfortably. Nervously, he clears his throat and is about to take his leave when the children grab his hand and ask to show him something. Not sure what else to do, he agrees and finds himself being dragged off to a little hidden alcove in the market. The children tell him that he'd shown up out of nowhere, so they guess that he must like hiding too. Tilks isn't sure how to respond to that, so he gives an awkward smile. At this point, one of the children's stomachs growl, drawing Tilks's attention. Concerned, he asks if they've eaten anything yet today. Judging from the sun, it's a little past noon. Skipping breakfast he can understand, he's guilty of doing that more than a few times himself. But skipping two meals is seriously bad, especially for kids. The children look embarrassed as they explain that they don't have any money to buy anything right now. And they won't until their parents get paid tomorrow. Tilks takes note of their thin frames, realizing that this must not be the first time that these two have had to go without due to their financial situation. This world must have a serious poverty problem. He thinks of the money that he's been accumulating from his missions and stands up. Telling the two to wait there, he marches back into the market. After a few minutes of walking, he finally manages to find a food stall. It's a meat stall. He can see lines of salted, cured, and dried meats sitting at the front of the stall. But from the sound and smell of sizzling meat in different sources, the stall is also selling freshly grilled meat for immediate consumption. Reaching into one of the pockets of his coat, he pulls out a handful of the little gold octahedrons that he'd earned by beating Heartless and completing missions. He knows that these things are accepted as currency in Twilight Town and by the Moogle that hangs around HQ, but he's not sure if they'll be accepted here. Suddenly, right before his eyes, the gold pieces transform into silver coins of varying size and shape. Tilks can't help but be amazed at the convenience of self-exchanging currency. The multiverse truly is an extraordinary place. He wonders if his original ever knew about things like this. Turning his mind back to the task at hand, he approaches the stall, the handful of silver coins still clutched in his hand. Back over with the children, it's been a few minutes since Tilks left and they're beginning to get worried. The market can be pretty dangerous, especially for a foreigner all on their own. They're just thinking that they should go looking for him when they see him approaching their little hiding spot. To their shock, he's carrying two bags in one hand and three grilled meat skewers in the other. Returning to his previous spot in the alcove, he holds out the skewers to the kids, telling them to take one each. Eyes wide with surprise, they hesitantly do so, taking the skewers and slowly taking bites out of the delicious treat. Tilks begins munching on his own skewer while passing the bags to the closest sibling. He tells them casually that one of the bags has about a pound of salted meat and a pound of dried meat, while the other has a selection of nuts, preserved fruits and vegetables that should be able to last a while if they store them somewhere cool. This startles the children so bad that they almost drop their skewers. Frantically, they tell him that they could never pay him back for this. Tilks shakes his head with a soft smile. He tells them that his job already provides housing and food, so the money he gets from it is mostly for extra provisions and leisure. But he doesn't really need that much in terms of extra provisions, and his only hobby is collecting and preserving flowers, so he doesn't really have anything to spend it on. The children are still insistent, asking if there isn't anything they can do to thank him for his kindness. Tilks finds their insistence on repaying him and calling him kind, kinda funny. Well, if you insist, just remember me and we'll call it even. Despite it being a joke, the kids get determined gleams in their eyes, telling him that they will never forget him or his kindness. 
They even compare him to someone called Aladdin. Somehow, the name twigs something at the back of Tilks' mind. Where has he heard that name before? Curious, he asks them to elaborate, whereupon he's given a Cliff Notes version of the events of the Kingdom Hearts version of the Aladdin movie, including the rumor about the Cave of Wonders. After a few minutes of this, they've all finished their skewers and Tilks is beginning to think that he's been on this mission a little too long. And now that he's gotten quite a wealth of information from the two kids, he can safely return to HQ without running the risk of gaining Sykes' ire. So, bidding the children goodbye, he makes his way back to the portal. Just as he's about to reach it, however, he's startled by a blue-winged cat landing on his shoulder. Smiling a very pleased smile at the startled look on Tilks' face, the cat thanks him for helping the kids. Jumping from the brunette's shoulder, he comments that he'd only intended to give the stuck-up merchant a few grey hairs. He hadn't expected the guy to get so violent. Tilks' eyes widen in surprise as something clicks. He asks the cat if he's the one that threw something at his head. The cat grins a Cheshire cat grin and confirms. He then gives a slight bow and introduces himself as Chaos. Head tilted in curious confusion, Tilks asks if he's being metaphorical, literal, or if that's just his name. Chaos Snick is saying, a little from column A, a little from column B. He then explains to the team that his life's work is bringing chaos and mischief to the lives of all he sees. Tilks frowns as he kneels down to be closer to eye level with the cat, asking if that means he's working with the Heartless. Chaos gives a firm and direct no, before explaining that the Heartless are more up Destructions Alley, and even he's not very fond of them. No, no, no. Chaos's calling in life is to break up the status quo, bring a little surprise into people's life, and yes, also a little inconvenience, but he's not interested in actually doing damage. He just doesn't want the world to get boring. Hearing that, Tilks can't help the small smile that forms on his face and draws Chaos' attention. Chaos raises an eyebrow in question and Tilks tells him that he thinks Chaos reminds him of someone, though he doesn't know who. Chaos smiles that Cheshire Cat grin again and tells Tilks that he's quite interesting. He pulls out a feather from his wing and hands it to Tilks, saying that he has a feeling he'll find it useful. Tilks takes the feather and feels a tug at the back of his mind. Calling out his summoning window, he presses the feather to it. Just like the crystals that the Heartless drop, the feather is absorbed into the window. As soon as the feather is completely absorbed, the image of Chaos appears in the line with his other summons. Chaos chuckles, saying that Tilks really is an interesting one, and to use his double anytime he wants. With that, he turns and vanishes into thin air. And that, everyone, is where I'm going to leave the story for now. Join me next time as Tilks goes on more solo missions and returns to a world that holds more mysteries than the organization thinks. I'm Rune, see you next chapter.